grace-filled kindness rarely stays in the same place. It passes from person to person, connecting everyone in its path. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have been caught in the path of His unlimited grace and His inspiring kindness. We help the sick because Jesus healed the sick. We welcome vulnerable people into our lives because Jesus welcomed the worst of us into His family. His life made His love clear. This year, we are highlighting ministries in Kentucky who are making the love of Christ more clear through their acts of kindness. Their work is made possible through generous contributions to the Eliza Broadus offering. As you'll see in our video series, these ministries came into situations that they couldn't control but were ready to face. Your giving to this offering ensures that these ministries will continue to be the hands and feet of Christ with gospel intentionality. To learn more about this offering, visit kywmu.org forward slash EBO and see where the path of Jesus kindness will take you. Well, amen. We want to continue just to say thank you to those who have generously given to the Eliza Broad Estate Missions Offering. And according to our email update we received today from Ms. Davis, we are uh, currently um, $338.25 is what we need in order to reach our goal. And so if you'd prayerfully consider giving to that, there are those uh, envelopes that you can use uh, in the back and, and the offering plates are there. Well, we are uh, dedicating this week or have been dedicating this week to celebrating uh, the leadership of Dr. Donnie Fox. And so with that, we had one of his close friends with us on Tuesday who preached the Word of God for us. And today we follow that up with another one of Dr. Fox's longtime friends and uh, longtime colleagues. And he is, I might remind you, no stranger to Clear Creek. <clears throat> Amen. We all love Dr. Jay Sulfords as well. Appreciate uh, his leadership and uh, serving as academic dean. He's wore a number of hats at our institution and served the Lord faithfully here. He himself is uh, also on his farewell tour as uh, he's winding down his time here at Clear Creek in that capacity. And uh, so, Dr. Sulfords, we love you. And I know that uh, you have a love and appreciation for Dr. Fox, and he does for you likewise. And so we're looking forward to you bringing the word of God to us today. Unspoken prayer request, show of hands, amen. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, Father. We know that every good and perfect gift comes down from above. Lord, we ask that you would just invade this place today with your presence, that, Father, you would move among us by your power through the singing of your praises and the preaching of your word. Be with our singers and musicians today. Anoint them from on high. We pray that as well for your preacher today. Be with Dr. Sulfridge as he comes to preach your word. May you just strengthen him. Him for that task, loose his tongue and uh, preach through him today that we would hear from heaven, it would move our hearts. Lord, we do pray for every request mentioned that's on each and every person's mind today. Lord, we pray you would just superintend each of those needs and that, Father, you, Lord, would just be glorified, Lord, through, through each of those circumstances, each of those situations as your will unfolds and you do as you choose to do. Lord, we pray and ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Oh, why don't you stand and sing with us? Oh, my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song must end, and you never do. So I throw my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. Nothing else fit for a 
king Except for hearts singing hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one
in time of prayer. Dear my Father, Lord, uh, we praise you. Thank you for this wonderful day, thank you for this wonderful morning, that this wonderful opportunity that we can come here and just learn about you through your word. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to praise, your game, uh, praise your name once again. Uh, for you, the one king that's one true fit, the, tr the one, fi uh, <laughs> one king that it's true, Lord, and uh, we love you and thank you for all that you've done, and I uh, pray that you would just speak through us through this message and um, that we would just get something from it, like uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, we just love you and just say prayer. Amen. Well, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the music to this point. And thank you for the privilege of preaching uh, in this week. Uh, last speaker, David Perica, was a graduate of the early 90s. And uh, he and Dr. Fox and myself were here together as students. For those of you who are students, now the early 90s, that was the period of time before 2000 came along. <laughs> I'm more and more mindful of how old I am. 
It's been quite a ride, Dr. Fox. I was just thinking uh, this morning about the time when we were students together and working the third shift in the same factory and then leave work and hurry up to get here for that first class and go to class till about two or three o'clock in the evening and then drive back and uh, do your studying and do your sermon preparation and that sort of thing before you have to go back to work again. And uh, almost invariably we would end up in the Fox's den just before we left after class to start home. And uh, Dr. Fox would always say the same thing to me. He'd say, now man, let's leave together. We'll look out for each other in case one of us goes to sleep on the way home. <laughs> and after hearing that so many times, I started to think about it. And I asked him one time, I said, well, we're in separate cars. What would we do if one of us did go to sleep? <laughs> and he says, man, at least there'd be somebody there to pick up the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and we've sort of been in that role ever since. One of us being there when the other one needs somebody to pick up the pieces. And so I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak uh, on this day. I want to ask you, if you would, to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. When you find your place in God's Word and get to that verse we're going to start with, if you would stand up with me in honor of God's Word. Matthew's Gospel, we see, at that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before him and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your promises that are attached to your word. And we thank you for the shining example of John the Baptist and your work through him. And God, I pray today that you would strengthen me, that you would speak through me. I stand realizing that, Father, only you could take one such as myself with broken thoughts and stammering tongue and feet of clay and imperfect ways only you could take a tool such as that and do something that's worth the time of these good people. But I trust that you can. And Father, I just pray that you would not only do it, but do it to your honor and your glory. If it's your will that I be made to look a fool, Lord, that you might be appreciated and worshiped. God, speak to us today toward that end. We pray in Jesus' name and amen. You may be seated. Now, I stand before you today realizing that this is a congregation who knows the rules of preaching. I'm not talking about hermeneutics and exegesis versus eisegesis and text-driven opposed to subject-driven and that sort of thing. I'm talking about those rules of preaching that we all know, but we just don't say them out loud. You know, like the rule that if you have either less or more than three points, you ought to apologize for it. 
because we know your number of points is supposed to line up with the Trinity, and it's supposed to be three of them. Uh, we don't say that, but we know that. And I also know that in any congregation, a preacher is allowed at least one il extra biblical illustration. Uh, now, the ones that come from the Bible don't count, but at least one extra biblical illustration for each one of those three points. And, and so I'm going to claim that privilege, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, and, and so hang with me. You know you're in trouble when the preacher has to tell you up front not to go to sleep. Don't hang with me because I'm going to go ahead and get my illustrations out of the way right at the very first, okay? We'll go ahead and go, just work right through all three of them that I'm allowed. And it's kind of like, you know, getting the salad out of the way so you can concentrate on the steak. We'll, we'll, we'll get the, the illustrations out of the way so we can concentrate on the Scripture. So if you leave out on before I get through the illustrations, go, go here saying he didn't preach the Bible. He was just, you know, preaching the newspaper or something because I'm going to get there. Uh, but I want to talk to you today about the emperor's new clothes... And a subtitle would be Henry VIII, Nostradamus, the Queen of England, and John the Baptist. If we were playing Jeopardy, I guess that would be what are four things that have nothing to do with one another. <laughs> but that's what we're going to do as we look at our text today. And, and since I did have to remind you and tell you about when the 1990s happened... I guess I need to ask this question because I, I use illustrations now that I find out people weren't born when they happen. Uh, that happens at the, this stage of your ministry. Uh, let me get a show of hands here. Who is familiar with a story, the title of it, The Emperor's New Clothes? Oh, that's good. I won't have to do a whole lot of explaining. I'll just sort of remind you a little bit about it. It's a classic. It was written by Hans, Hans Christian Andersen. It's Hans, you know, it's not Hans, it's Hans. Hans Christian Andersen, first published in 1837. See, I didn't expect anybody here was around then, but uh, I didn't know if it had faded from people's memory. Uh, but that story has illustrated many, many declarations of flagrant sin that's often ignored by the masses. It's been a classic throughout the years, and you know and remember that story. You remember at least the main points of it, that this emperor was very self-involved and very self-indulgent and very arrogant and very proud and could have anything he wanted, decided he was going to have the best clothes that was available to anybody in the world and decided he would hire someone to do that job and he ended up hiring a couple of shysters who took advantage of him and they pretended to have some uh, uh, the ability to weave some fabric that would be so fine and, and, and so advanced that only the elite would be able to see and appreciate it. And they said those that are of lesser intelligence, they, they won't be able to see it, let alone appreciate it. And so they weave with this invisible, <laughs> non-existent thread, this cloth that didn't exist, just pretended to be weaving, and you remember the story, nobody was willing to say, well, I can't see anything because they'd look stupid. And so they just said, wow, what fabulous fabric that is. What tremendous clothing. And the emperor, bless his heart, ends up parading his new outfit down through town. And he's not wearing anything and nobody will tell him so. And so everybody just says, look what beautiful clothes he has on. The emperor's new clothes. Henry VIII, illustration number two. Henry VIII was king of England in the 1500s, from 1509 to 1547. And he's best known for his many marriages, his six wives. If you have a picture of Henry VIII in your mind, you're probably seeing a man holding a turkey leg. <laughs> because that's the way he's depicted most, his appetites in every sense of the word. He was a man of excesses, sort of like the emperor was. And he's best known for his marriages, but especially his efforts to have one marriage, that one to Catherine of Aragon, annulled because he wanted to move on to another. 
And the Pope said the church does not allow it. And he and the Pope had a tremendous disagreement that ended up in the Church of England separating from the Roman Catholic Church. And so they really, and you already knew this, but we just go ahead and, and say it out loud today, the beginnings of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, really has its roots in a king who wanted to do something that the Church of Rome would not allow him to do. And so that's the kind of person that Henry VIII was. And so he not only started his own church, you know, you won't let me do what I want to do in that one, I'll just start my own. And by the way, Baptist, let's not criticize him too much. We got a whole lot of churches that were started on those exact same terms. Uh, but then he appointed himself as supreme head of the church. So he's not only king of the nation, he was the head of the church. And so the church was birthed to accommodate his divorce. Uh, his new church took its place, uh, took place of the church of Rome. He used the money that had been used for covenants and monasteries and had been sent to the church at Rome. He used them for his own personal appetites. I mean, he was just not a very nice person. And so the Church of England is stuck with this man who has obvious character flaws, and he is also the head of the church. And I just wonder how many people during that time stood up and publicly cried out, the emperor has no clothes. The head of our country and of our church is not a very moral man. And I wonder how many in the 1800s read this new story about the emperor's new clothes and thought back to the 1500s and Henry VIII. And by the way, some other news from the 1500s, if it can be news when it happened in the 1500s. That was the century in which a man named Nostradamus was born. And Nostradamus, you may have read about him. A lot of people like to follow him. His prophecies, even though they are from way back in the 1500s, still around. And a lot of people like to look at world events and go back and read Nostradamus and say, he predicted this. The thing that gets under my skin about it is that they never read his prophecies and then say, this is going to happen. They wait till something happens and go back. And his language is so veiled, you can make it say anything because it really doesn't say anything. I mean, you know, it's like he'll come, they'll find a part in his, in his prophecies when he'll say, oh, when the moon turns to blood and the corn is on the ear, then the mice will play in the garden. And say, they'll say, see, he, he predicted my trip to Disneyland. He mentioned a mouse. I mean, that's about the way they stretched to say Nostradamus was really quite a prophet. But there's going to come an opportunity for us to test him out. Usually they wait till it happens and go back and try to fit it in. But now followers of Nostradamus are going the other way on it. And so those who study him say that he predicted the death of the Queen of England. Well, now I'll give him that one. He was right. She died. Of course, she was 96 years old, you know. I kind of thought it eventually would happen myself, but I didn't put it in print. <laughs> but we have a chance here to test his prophecies out. Because those who study him also predicted that Prince Charles would become king, they say. And Prince Charles did become king. It was kind of set up that way. But they say he's gone further than that. They say that Nostradamus says Prince Charles is reign will be very brief, that he will abdicate the throne and someone else will become king who was never expected to be king. Now, folks, they're getting out on a limb now because we get to watch and see if that happened. And I'll give you a hint, even if it does, I'm not going to go buy a book on Nostradamus. I mean, until his record is the equivalent of Isaiah, as far as getting things right, he's not got my attention. But suppose that really did happen. And a lot of people who think that will happen because of what they say that he said, excuse me, microphone, because of what they say that he said, uh, they say that uh, it would be because of the immorality of Charles. Now, we can't really argue that point, can we? Because we remember the story of his marriage 
with Diana and his affair with Camilla. And we remember all that. And a lot of people say that he doesn't have the right, if you would, he's not qualified to serve as king. And don't forget, the king is still the head of the church in England. And so I have to admit that I don't believe Nostradamus was a prophet, but I also have to admit that as I watch TV lately, I watch Charles and Camilla prayed as the new ruling monarchs, or the monarch and his bride, and understood that now he's also the head of the Church of England. And I thought the emperor has no clothes. But I wonder if students of Nostradamus, if this thing is as likely as winning the lottery were to happen. They say that his abdication would result not in Prince William being the king, because that would be expected, but they say it would be the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, who's way down the line if you look at those charts. A lot of things that have to happen. And by the way, in a strange turn of events, you may already know this, Harry is not the prince's real name. It's a nickname. His real name is Henry. And there's not been a, prince, uh, a King Henry since Henry VIII. So if that did happen, Harry or Henry would be Henry the IX. Just thought that was an interesting thing that you might need to know. But I've noticed that in Britain there are a few people, even though the tide of popular opinion is against them, holding up signs that say, well, for instance, one of them said, uh, introducing His Majesty the King, and under it it said, no thanks. There are some people that are standing up, but I wonder how, I, I'll always look when that happens for one of those men with the red outfit and the big furry hat, you know, to come marching out and take them away and deal with them privately. It doesn't usually end up well for those who point out sin in a sin-distorted world. The emperor doesn't like to have his exposure exposed. And his followers don't like to admit their gullibility and saying that everything is okay. And John the Baptist is a shining example of a suffering hero of truth. In Matthew 14, we see that it tells us the fame of Jesus was spreading through the land. People were noticing him. People were following after him. He was making a stir as God does when he walks here on earth. And some people were saying, that must be Elijah. Uh, that's the only way I can think that he could do the things that he does, the way he could perform the miracles that he performs. He, it must be Elijah. And other people said, well, it has to be one of the prophets. There's just something special about this Jesus. But there was at least one man who was not that excited about what was going on with Jesus. And our Bible says that at that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and he said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead and therefore mighty works do show the forth themselves in him. Here, here's the first truth I want to tell you. We've got the salad out of the way. We're going to the stake now. Let me, let me share one truth that you need to hang on to. In his own heart, the sinner knows that he is naked before God. He may not admit it out loud, but in his own heart, the sinner knows that he stands naked before God. Now, Herod had public consent because he was playing to the public. First he wanted to kill him, but then he was afraid to because they knew he was a prophet. And then he came to know him, I think. I, don't, I think there's a lot in the Scripture that we don't have. But obviously he came to know him, or either God was just touching his heart by rethinking it. But he started to show some sort of conviction of his feelings toward John the Baptist. But it says that Herod had laid hold on him and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had said to, to him... He had said to King Herod, it's not lawful for you to have her as your wife. It's not lawful by God's word for you to take your brother's wife. And he was saying that to a king who could speak him out of existence, and he knew it. 
But Herod knew that public consent mattered. And it says, when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Now, you can do what you need to to get people on your side. But when night comes and your head hits the pillow and there's nobody there but you and God, your sin will cry out to you. I think about King Ahab and Jezebel. I, I, I love that classic sermon. Beyond the sermons of Jesus, probably to my mind the most classic sermon ever delivered, and that's payday someday. And, and I think about that story of Ahab and Jezebel who murdered Naboth and stole his vineyard. And the prophet of God said to Ahab, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? If I could put that in East Tennessee English, he said, uh, aren't you a murderer and a thief that you killed Naboth and you took his vineyard? Hast thou killed and also taken possession? Thus saith the Lord, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs also lick your blood. And R.G. Lee in that classic sermon that's been re-preached thousands and thousands of times, he said when he talks about that and God having his prophet tell him that the same place that Naboth's blood was spilt, the dogs will lick your blood up. R.G. Lee says, I think that during those three years that Ahab never heard a dog bark that he didn't jump because he knew in his heart that he was wrong and God was going to make things right. He was without clothing, if you would, before God. And where's that phrase come from, by the way? All the way back to when sin came in the picture. Adam and Eve were without clothing in the garden. And they were pure and innocent, and they had nothing to hide. But the Bible says that after their sin, they hid from God. He asked them, why were they hiding what they say? Because we were naked. God said, who told you you were naked? Of course, he wasn't seeking information. He was trying to get them to understand what had happened. In his own heart, the sinner knows he is naked before God. Second point I want to share with you. If the sinner doesn't seek remedy for his sin, his sin will control him. Folks, if you don't deal with sin in the way the Bible says to deal with sin, it'll take over. Your sin will control you. You can't control it. John the Baptist is in prison because he pointed out the sin of Herod and Herodias. And he was willing to point to sin and call it sin. And I know that most of us here are young. Most of you here are young. And you have some idealistic, idealistic viewpoints about ministry. And you can probably see yourself being the hero for pointing to sin and calling it sin. And I admire that determination, but you need to balance it with some reality. There's evidence here that Herod was convicted of his sin uh, because it says that he had regretted when she asked for the head of John the Baptist. But his reaction was harsh when he was called out publicly. Let me tell you, even though you may think that you're going to be a hero for being the man of truth and pointing out sin and calling it sin, when you call a sinner out in public, his reaction is going to be harsh. And the reason it's going to be harsh is because you're going to strike a nerve that God has already made tender. Folks, you've not thought of something God didn't know. And if you're pointing to their sin and you're calling them a sinner, just know that God's already been wearing them out with their sin. And when the daughter of Herodias asked for John's head, it said Herod was sorry, but he did it. Why? He didn't want to be publicly shamed. He did it for the sake of those at the meal. And though he was convicted by his sin with Herodias, he ended up taking the same bait that he had taken with her mother. And when, his, when her daughter danced before him and it said she pleased him, and what it's saying is that she aroused him sensually. And so he fell to the same sin, the sin of lust that he had fallen into that caused him to take his brother's wife. 
It says, but when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before him and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. Isn't that the way sin works? We see evidence that he's thinking about John, even though he already was willing to kill him. Now he's thinking about him. It saddened him that she asked for his death. God's been dealing with his heart, even this hardened sinner. God's been dealing with his heart, and he's seeing where his sin has got him. But what happens? He sees another picture of another woman that brings the, uh, the same kind of feelings back to him. And what does he do? No, no, I, I got in trouble for that once. I'm going to stay away from it. No, that's not what he did. What he did is he said, Honey, I'll give you anything you want. Just tell me. I'll give you a blank check. Whatever you want, yours. And he's trapped again by his sin. And she being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head and a charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it be given to her. In his own heart, the sinner knows he's naked before God. If the sinner doesn't seek remedy for his sin, his sin will control him. But there's a child in that story that we talked about at the first, the emperor's new clothes, a child who was pure and honest. Children shame us sometimes by their honesty, don't they? And when everyone else was saying, what beautiful clothes... The child in his innocence says, the emperor has no clothes. So what about the one who speaks truth the way that child did? Does he become king? Does he get a parade? Is he publicly lauded for his honesty and his integrity? Does everyone bow to the truth? Usually not. Not in this world. Verse 10 says, And he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. Here's the third point I want to share with you. Sinners who are called out for sin tend to kill the messenger. We think that just because we proclaim the truth that we're going to become very popular, everybody's going to appreciate it, the world will all repent and Become holy. Well, we're only half right. We do need to proclaim the truth and we do need to call sin, sin. But never underestimate the power of sin or the obstinance of the sinner. I've stood in hospital rooms with people who were lost and admitted they were lost and dying and knew they were dying and died defying God. I think about the early days of my ministry. I was invited to come and speak to a man. And the doctors had told him the same thing they told his family. He said, it's not going to be weeks. It's not going to be days. It's probably not going to be hours. It may be a very few minutes. If you want to see their loved one, you need to go see him now. And everyone in Bell County knew this man was lost. And if you didn't know, you asked him and he'd tell you that he was lost. And I went into that man's room knowing that he may die before I left the room. And he knew that he may die before I left the room. And I shared the gospel with him. And I asked him when I shared the gospel, do you think this is something that you'd like to address? And he looked at me and so helped me God. He had a smirk on his face. And he said, well, I always thought that one day I might be in a bad enough shape to consider something like that. And I don't know what happened between that man and his maker in the last half a second of his life, but I know that what I witnessed tells me that he died with a smirk on his face and a curse on his lips. Never underestimate the power of sin or the obstinance of the sinner. And sinners who are called out for their sin tend to kill the messenger. Let me share just a few words from the last page of the emperor's new clothes. But he hasn't got anything on, the little child said. Did you ever hear such innocent prattle, said his father. And one person whispered to another what the child has said. He hasn't anything on, 
A child says he hasn't anything on. But he hasn't got anything on, the whole town cried at last. The emperor shivered, for he suspected they were right. But he thought the procession has to go on. So he walked more proudly than ever as his nobleman held high the train that wasn't there at all. Let me share just a few words from our passage. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel. And she brought it to her mother. So what's the use? Why stand if it just means stand and die? I did not say that those words were the last words of John's story. I'll end with these words from Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them which are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. If you have sin in your heart, you know it. If you don't seek remedy for it, it will control you. And Jesus is the only answer. But to the child of God, I want you to hear this. If you stand up and speak up for the glory of God, and they kill you for it, and when all said and done, Jesus says of you what he said of John the Baptist, folks, you've won. You've won. Be known for living the truth and speaking the truth. But don't expect it to pay you in this life. Look forward to what Jesus has in eternity. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to have the courage to do what is right, the sensibility to know that lost sinners aren't going to appreciate it, and God, the dependence upon the Holy Spirit that maybe with a few will be able to make a difference. But God, whether they change or whether they do not change, let us be found on your side. And we'll thank you for the privilege in Jesus' name and amen.